Well, good afternoon. It's a must to thank Jean-Michel Glassant and the organizers from the Loyola de Palacio Chair and the Florence School of Regulation for putting together this extraordinary event and for letting me uh, be a part of it. Um, well, I shall try to break my world record of 180 slides per hour. Uh, and I have an arrangement with my, our friendly controller to, if in case I fail in doing that. Um, okay, so the issue that um, this uh, I'll, I'll address is whether the European Union has a true energy policy or rather a collection of independent initiatives or partial energy policies and whether these policies interact uh, in a positive way with one another. And um, okay, um, my first point is that a truly consistent energy policy will only exist in an ideal world. In that ideal world, we will have um, all the major externalities um, internalized via prices uh, like carbon levy or cap and trade, and the market agents will behave rationally, uh, so the market prices will attract investment, we will have advanced metering that will bring uh, adequate consumer response, then uh, that uh, we will have some clean uh, and um, technologies attracted by the market prices that will be deployed, will meet the requirements of security, environmental, technical, and the market prices will remunerate those technologies and the member states will not interfere with, the national, I mean, with nationalistic measures. Of course, this is ideal. We know that uh, we have uh, market failures that um, demand some kind of regulatory measures. And so we have environmental externalities, we have networks that have monopolistic features, we have uh, um, uh, designs that uh, in the markets, electricity and gas, that happen to be more complex than we initially thought, then um, the markets are short-sighted and don't see the, the long-term objectives. And we have uh, these um, national regulatory authorities that, um, well, uh, have disparities in uh, their uh, regulatory measures and uh, they have uh, well, different approaches that are not harmonized. And that requires an explicit regulatory measures to address these shortcomings. I'm going to start by talking about the, something that puts everything together, which is this um, uh, European Energy Roadmap. But I will start by uh, talking about, uh, very briefly, uh, one of the uh, items that is included in the roadmap that was highlighted by people Ranchi this morning, and which is this um, very much needed regulatory measure, uh, energizing development, that tries to, is a commitment that uh, was ex made explicit uh, two or three weeks ago, um, uh, indicating that the European Union will contribute, uh, will, will have a target by 2030 uh, to provide electricity, um, I mean, energy access to half a billion people out of the 1.4 billion people that don't have it today. And, uh, well, Danny Ellerman said this morning that the EU is long on words and short on inactions, which is true. Uh, I hope that that will be um, converted into an action. And it is true that the um, International Energy Agency has set as a target uh, the amount of $48 billion dollars, uh, per year to achieve this goal, and that the European Union is committing 50 uh, million euros per year to uh, mobilize uh, private investment. And, um, but I think it's, a, it's an excellent signal, and I'm proud to be a European uh, when I see measures like this. Um, then, talking about the uh, energy roadmap, I think this is a synthesis and justification of the European energy policy, and um, it provides the indispensable long-term vision that it is needed. Um, why do we need a, an energy roadmap? Well, uh, we could say that Europe is small in terms of the contribution to the consumption of primary energy uh, or contribution to emissions of CO2. Uh, the value actually is close to um, 11 percent and by 2030 could be of the order of 8 percent. And uh, we could also say that, uh, well, this is this graph, 
here that the, in this discussion that we have in Europe about setting the target at 20% reduction or 30% reduction, the difference amounts to two weeks of Chinese CO2 emissions. Um, but still, I think that it's important that we realize that um, we have to have a, a long-term vision in order to be consistent in the measures that we adopt and that we have to set some example, at least in the due process, of having uh, long-term um, um, analysis of what we do so that uh, it conditions what we do now, taking into account that the, the uh, investment cycle is about in infrastructures for electricity and gas is about 40 years or more. And then we are that close to 2050 right now. Um, so what have we learned from the Energy Roadmap 2050? Well, I would say, and if we look at this um, table that summarizes the results, uh, numerical results of the analysis, uh, if you concentrate on the left um, most uh, column, which is a summary, like an average of all the different the scenarios that have been considered, it is clear that the main priority in all scenarios, is an average also, is energy efficiency. The second priority is um, renewables. So the biggest share of um, clean technologies in 2050 will come from renewables. And then we see um, also that there will be a strong reduction in oil and gas imports. There will be a substitution, so that will increase our, our uh, energy security, reducing the energy dependence. Uh, we see some substitution in the midterm of gas uh, that will replace um, coal. Um, and then uh, an important message also is that electricity uh, almost doubles its share in the final energy demand in 2050, uh, reaching the value of about 40%, and, um, because it will increase contributing also to the decarbonization of transportation and heating. Uh, we have also learned from this roadmap that the cost of decarbonization will be modest. The total compliance uh, will be less than 1% more than the reference case uh, where all these more drastic measures will be not adopted. And the cost impact on households will be about 0.7% of the budget uh, of the um, households. So we are talking about modest impacts. Uh, there are some analysis of uncertainties that I will not go into. Um, uh, which is of, uh, obviously many of the measures that will be taken during the next decade will be critical. So uh, to the question uh, of the title of the presentation, which is do we have a, a true European energy policy? I think that the answer is, is clear, yes. Um, the roadmap shows that the three pillars are at the core of the European strategy, that the strategy is right in putting the emphasis on those pillars. Therefore, the Euro Europe is in the right path by adopting these pillars in the pursuit of a sustainable, uh, uh, low-carbon competitive economy. Um, well, if you think uh, that we don't have a true energy policy, I would recommend you to think of the U.S., um, where that long-term vision and consistent energy policy is plainly non-existing. I would say, it's a personal hypothesis, that probably this is related in some sense to the uh, political organization of the decision-making process. Uh, the people making proposals, decisions, and implementing them in Europe are less subject to uh, being elected um, and to the the direct um, um, reach of the voters. And while this is completely different in the US where congressmen and senators who make decisions about all these issues are elected individually uh, in their constituencies. And uh, while well, that is a, uh, has its drawbacks, of course, but I think that has this blessing of allowing uh, decision makers, implementers in Europe uh, to have a long-term vision and not to be subject to the immediate need to be re-elected. Um, well, going back to the uh, three pillars, uh, I will try to highlight 
the, what I see are the major issues for discussion now. Regarding mitigation of climate change, I think I unfortunately have to highlight that although the, the emission trading scheme is a very good mechanism in theory, it is ineffective because the signal is very weak. So I hope, we hope that the signal could be reinforced and will do the trick in the future, but it is not doing the trick now. Uh, regarding security of supply, I think the highlight is double. I would say that despite the security of supply directive, the national regulatory authorities are not willing to give up local priority of supply with their local assets in clear violation in their laws of what uh, the European directive says. And also, other topic that I will cover in uh, the next slide is that the shortcomings in the design of the electricity and gas markets that have been amply um, exposed today uh, may, may make difficult the investment that is needed in the future um, uh, in assets for generation of electricity and infrastructures of gas and electricity. Regarding the third item, the internal electricity and gas markets, um, well, it has been said repeatedly today that um, we have to go beyond the issues of the immediate implementation of these markets. This is a task that is absolutely necessary, but I think that in the medium and long term, that will not be an issue. And the issue could be that the design of the markets have to be rethought again because uh, of the challenges that come from a particularly large amount of intermittent generation, uh, from demand response, um, advanced technologies, and uh, so the issue is how to promote investment in um, generation, investment in network infrastructures, and how to elicit demand response and uh, being able to accommodate storage at levels that we have not even imagined yet, but it will be necessary that they will come. Um, so examples of what will be needed is um, how in the, net, in the design of the market, how to incorporate networks better into operation with novel prices maybe, uh, as it is done very well in the US. Um, how to incorporate the, the impact of this intermittent generation in, in prices and how to care about the remuneration of investments under the uh, existing or adapted pricing schemes or harmonization of capacity mechanisms that uh, is badly needed uh, in a short um, um, range in Europe. Um, if we look at the overall picture, I think that it is clear that what we are missing is that we are talking about the three pillars independently. They are solid, as I have said, but we are missing a coherent, comprehensive view to coordinate the objectives and make progress in these three pillars. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have a policy, but that means that the, we need some additional coordination. And I, I will highlight that we need solid regulation practice, that it is not always the case. We need intermediate targets of some kind to guide the private investment and the innovation efforts, and we need to adjust the intensity of the targets of each pillar so we have a, a coherent uh, path to the future. When we talk about sound regulation, it may seem obvious, but uh, it is true, and I've been regulator in Spain, I'm regulator in Ireland, and I've been involved in this regulatory business for a long time, that we fail consistently in providing sound regulation. Given that most of the market for clean energy is policy-driven, then policy-driven market regulation is a risk. And we need to, if we want to unlock finance for clean energy, there is a need for investment-grade policy. And investment-grade policy um, means that it has to be, I am borrowing from uh, a study of uh, Chatham House, uh, loud, long, and legal. Loud, loud, the signals have to be strong. The ETS, emission trading scheme, is not providing uh, sound, I mean, uh, loud signals. Long, uh, the instruments have to provide uh, a certain assurance 
that will be there for a long period of time so that the investments will benefit from uh, those or will, um, uh, will live in that invest in environment and they have to be sound, they have be to be legal uh, based on clear, stable and well-established regulatory framework. And then, um, and I will finish with this consideration, uh, we have to, um, well, to think more about this debate about the uh, immediate targets. Uh, it has been said today that it is a, a debate that is open, and I will throw some um, ideas about this. Uh, should technology targets be set for 2030? Well, of course not. Why? Well, because if we talk, for instance, just the case for renewables, uh, renewables make it more expensive to meet the carbon targets because they are not the cheapest way to achieve that purpose. They waste resources, economic resources, that could be used uh, to stimulate maybe low-carbon innovation, research. They will disrupt markets, the discovery process that markets have because we are uh, somehow picking winners. They will undermine the European trading scheme by lowering prices. So instead, the energy policy after 2020 should uh, keep it simple, focus on carbon price and the single instrument, and avoid technology-specific deployment targets. Uh, we should focus on carbon pricing, and um, we should use that money maybe to subsidize research and development and overcome behavioral barriers to energy efficiency, uh, consumers. Or maybe not. Maybe technologies, uh, I mean, the targets should be set for 2030. Of course, yes. Why not? Because carbon price, which is a beautiful instrument, for the time being is not loud enough, is not long enough, and it is not legal enough. So it's not doing the trick. So if we want to move along the three pillars, we need to do something else. And, um, well, investment in these subsidized technologies needs an adequate and credible regulatory framework. So we need, they need investors, private investors, they need clear targets and strong enough economic signals for 2030. They need adequate support instruments for research and development while it's possible trying to avoid picking winners as much as possible. Thank you for your attention.